In this lesson group, we are gearing up for our unit challenge to reduce the carbon footprint of food. But we're still wondering about some more information. We're going to focus in on two big questions. What food is good for my body? And what food is good for the planet? But like all Green Ninja units, this isn't just a learning experience. We want students to connect their learning to their own lives and then take action. So this section of lessons prepares students for the low carbon cookbook project that they're going to be doing soon in the culminating experience. In lesson 3.21, students revisit the phenomenon that people and other animals get their energy from food. And we challenge them to create a succinct one to two sentence summary explaining how we get our energy from food. But our food isn't pure glucose, so what nutrients does the body need? Students are going to obtain information from internet resources to answer that question. Students are then going to analyze their own food choices based on their food journals. We've got the Analyzing Food Choices handout to help guide them through the process. In Lesson 3.22, we review our discoveries from yesterday by filling in a concept map about food. Then, students complete Part 2 of their Analyzing Food Choices handouts. They can even move on to Part 3 if they have time. In Lesson 3.23, students need to finish their Analyzing Food Choices project by the end of the class period. That means that they should have description wheels for each of the five food groups plus oils, a chart showing foods that students ate in each group, along with the number of servings and the recommended servings filled in, their MyPlate template filled in with the names of foods and number of servings, and a claim evidence reasoning that answers the question, did my food choices meet the MyPlate food guidelines? So we addressed our first question about what our body needs. Now it's time to focus on the next question. What's the impact of our food choices on the planet? We'll learn that even our food has a carbon footprint. This graph of burritos really illustrates the phenomenon. A veggie burrito has a much lower carbon footprint than a beef burrito. In Lesson 3.24, students begin by briefly recapping the movement of energy. We're going to give them some statements about the sun's energy, photosynthesis, digestion, cellular respiration, and they need to move them into chronological order. Then students list the stages of a human life cycle so that they can think about a new type of life cycle, the life cycle of food. And they receive a set of food life cycle cards and they have to arrange them into the order that they think makes the most sense. Students discuss how each stage contributes to its energy use and therefore greenhouse gas emissions. Next, students receive a new phenomenon that a veggie burrito has a lower carbon footprint than a beef burrito. One of my favorite Green Ninja videos really brings this phenomenon to light and allows us to have a rich class discussion about the topic. Students groups then receive a set of food cards and arrange them from lowest to highest carbon footprint. They're going to discuss the best they can uh, with the information that they write, know right now and decide as a group. And then we're going to come back in a couple of days and revise this after we learn more. In Lesson 3.25, students begin by viewing the stages of the food life cycle that they came up with in the last class period. We relate the food life cycle to the unit roadmap image using especially the third panel where Andy is wondering, what does it mean for food to be low carbon? Over the next few days, each group of students will become an expert on the environmental impact of one stage of the food life cycle and produce a pamphlet. They'll share their pamphlet with other teams so that the class can combine forces to answer the question, which stage of the food life cycle produces the most greenhouse gas emissions? We distribute the Carbon Footprint Informational Pamphlet handout and discuss the expectations and rubric. The instructions also have some links to some web pages, and students are going to spend the rest of the class period reading those articles and organizing the information that they obtain. They also have the entire next class period to work on their pamphlets. After two lessons of working on the pamphlets in Lesson 3.27, students put the finishing touches on them, and then they share their expertise on the one stage of the food life cycle that their group did with other students in the class. They're going to be listening to each other and taking notes to learn from others so that they can get a complete picture of the food life cycle from beginning to end. Finally, students participate in the unit concept checkpoint number two, which is a formative assessment that provides students with the opportunity to really better understand some of the primary concepts covered in the unit so far. In Lesson 3.28, now that students have learned about the carbon footprint of the industrial food cycle, students dig into a case study connecting native Hawaiian land management to some of the Western science concepts. We introduce students to the traditional agriculture in Hawaii in a short presentation. Then students watch a video about how the director of the Limahuli Garden and Preserve manages that space today. 
Students then discussed the Hawaiian Sustainability Foundation's pledge of goals for a sustainable future. And finally, students create a pledge or a list of goals for their own food life cycle that will reduce their own carbon footprint. I think we're ready now for our culminating experience. 